Okay, first of all, um, buenos dias, everybody. Uh, welcome to the NAA Dealmakers Forum. This is the second forum of this year. I'm Solange Brooks. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the New America Alliance. And uh, as, you, as you all know, at NAA, we believe that inclusion and diversity is essential to having a robust ecosystem that will create alpha. This ecosystem that is diverse uh, with a multiplicity of ideas and approaches is gold. But we also want to point out that hand in hand with uh, diversity and inclusion, the investment landscape is also paying attention to the role of environmental, social, and governance matters, or as we call it, ESG. Uh, this interest has reverberated more profoundly in the past 18 months than ever before. And it makes sense. Um, the pandemic accelerated the effects uh, of evidence of a warming planet and climate change. And during the pandemic, we also came face to face with a backlash against systemic racial inequality, which cannot be ignored anymore. And finally, we have the need for an economic recovery that encompasses all of the citizens and also the global family. So we're in for a real treat as our panel today, led by our very own Milton Berlinski from Reverence Capital Partners, will explore and discuss diversity, inclusion, and ESG, and creating alpha with a panel of very distinguished people. Thank you so very much. Um, Gerson? Thank you, Solange. Welcome, everyone. I was asked to keep uh, the intro brief, uh, which is good because I couldn't do Milton's uh, tenured uh, career uh, justice. Uh, everyone's received the bio, so I'll hit a, a couple of highlights. Uh, Milton founded Reverence Capital in 2013 after a 26 year career at Goldman Sachs, uh, where he was a founding member of the uh, FIG group. He also served as the head of strategy and corporate development in the period after Goldman's IPO. Uh, and uh, following his uh, tenure, tenure there, he had responsibility for coverage of the firm's financial sponsor and hedge fund clients. But I, I think what I want to point out here, more importantly, given the topic of ESG, is how Milton has actualized his commitment to underserved communities through service on various boards, including the New America Alliance, as well as the board of directors for SEO. He also serves on the board of the Ronald McDonald House the advisory board for our alma mater, for our shared alma mater, the Wharton School, and the Mount Sinai Department of Surgery Advisory Board. Now, those are some of the formal and more professional accomplishments for Milton, but I, I also want to share a compelling personal story. I, I think it's little known that Milton represents and reflects the Latino diaspora. He was raised on the island of Aruba, born to a Brazilian mother and a Polish father, he has uh, lived the American Latino dream, a dream that began at Cal State Northridge. Uh, Milton, you didn't know this, but I went to middle school down the road from, from your alma mater. Uh, and uh, he is officially, as a result, a matador. Uh, so that, that's my new nickname for you, Milton. So <laughs> as they officially say on the island, Bombini, and please, let's get started. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, Gerson indicated, I'm the uh, managing partner of Reverence Capital and also a proud board member of the uh, New America Alliance. Um, I think just to set the stage, you know, I've been involved with many advocacy organizations over the course of my career. And the NAA really stands out for effectively combining what I think of as change producing advocacy with a keen understanding of the needs of its member organization. So to uh, Solange and everybody uh, involved in the organization, bravo, um, I think the team is fantastic. Um, just quickly on Reverence, we are a uh, private equity fund manager with a thematic sector focus on financial services. We manage about 5.4 billion today. Um, we're also building an opportunistic private credit team. We're laser focused on, on diversity and inclusion. In addition to our diverse uh, ownership, we aim to maintain at least 50% of the firm and 30% of our portfolio company boards as with, with women and persons of color. 
Um, ESG is also of critical importance to how we approach portfolio investments. In the financial services sectors, as you know, issues of corporate governance are as, uh, are as important as financial performance, as the latter cannot be maintained without strong board oversight, strong anti-corruption and KYC measures, employment rights, transparent record keeping and attention to FCPA among others. We also work collaboratively with our limited partners to incorporate their priorities into decision-making and have committed to avoid certain industries such as oil and gas, thermal coal mining, assault weapons manufacturing and private for-profit prisons. Um, the title of today's panel, as Solange indicated, is Diversity, Inclusion, and ESG. Creating alpha is important question that we're facing in the industry. Many of you on this call, like Revlins, believe that diverse organizations who pay attention to ESG factors have a significantly better likelihood of generating alpha. Yet this is a re relatively recent occurrence in the, in the industry, particularly in North America, as it was not long ago that ESG and diversity were viewed more as an advocacy of issues presented by trustees other than those who were informed by their diverse life expectations outside the boardroom. I would imagine, imagine that there are many on this call who are not yet certain whether a true do double bottom line exists, whether you indeed can do well by doing good and I hope this session helps inform and guide your thoughts on the subject. Let's frame the discussion today with some real world numbers, if you don't mind. According to PwC, the latest global private equity responsible investment survey, nearly 200 GPs, and these exclude the venture capital, have a sustainable investing total of more than $30 trillion globally. In the United States, ESG-focused AUM grew by $5 trillion just in the last two years. And according to Deal Cloud, ESG continues to pick up steam as 56% of the GP surveyed had increased their diligence and measurement of ESG within the last six months alone. From an operational standpoint, PwC reports that 72% of the PE managers always screen target companies for ESG risk and opportunities at the pre-acquisition phase, and nearly 60% have turned down a potential investment or partner on ESG grounds. ESG has also become less compartmentalized. It used to be that there was a team specifically focused on that. Today, all the partners in most firms have that as their mandate. From the lens of diversity and inclusion, almost half of PE firms have set gender and ethnic targets for their workforce and 77% refer to diversity as a core value. What has been the performance impact with all of this? According to GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network, 86% of PE investors say ESG and impact investments are performing in line with or exceeding their financial expectations. Taken together, these percentages indicate to us that indeed ESG is mainstream and likely a permanent part of our marketplace. So in the common wisdom, correct, does ESG investing attention, att and attention to diversity create alpha? To help guide our thinking in this regard, let us turn to our panel experts. Our first panelist is Joanne Price. Joanne is the co-founder and managing partner of Fairview Capital. She is a member of Fairview Investment Committee and manager of all of Fairview's sponsored funds. Prior to co-founding Fairview, Ms. Price served as the president of National Association of Investment Companies headquartered in DC. And she serves on a number of national advisory committees and private equity advisory boards. Ms. Price also currently ser serves on the board of Howard University uh, of Visitors, on the YMCA of Greater Hartford Board of Trustees, on the Wilson Gray YMCA Board of Advisors, and on the Amstead Center for Art and Culture Board Trustees. Additionally, she serves on the Apollo Theater uh, Foundation Board in New York City, Trinity Health New England, Blue Hill Civic Association, and just recently has completed the term as chairperson at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving in Hartford, Connecticut. And she's obviously um, a, a graduate of Howard University. Our next panelist is James Sokas. He's the managing director 
uh, in uh, Blackstone's Tactical Opportunities Group. Mr. Sokus has been involved with the firm's investment in FireEye, Snowflake, Diligent, EpiServer, and Titus. Before joining Blackstone, uh, Mr. Soka serves as the general partner and co-manager of Updata Partners, a boutique growth equity firm focused on the software industry. He earlier served as a managing director in, at Credit Suisse and DLJ, providing M&A and capital raising advice to companies in the global software industry. He later joined the senior management team of one of his investment banking clients, Semantic, as head of corporate development, leading its strategic acquisitions, alliances, and corporate venture investing. He serves on the board of, of managers of the University of Virginia Alumni Association, the board of trustees of Potomac School, and was appointed to serve on the board of corrections for the Commonwealth of Virginia. He is an honors graduate of University of Virginia and a graduate of Harvard Business School. Our third panelist uh, is Leon Bruches. Leon serves as a partner at Palladium Equity Partners, Previously, he was an M&A uh, uh, professional at Lehman Brothers. Mr. Brujas serves on the board of directors of Palladium Portfolio Companies, Daniel Jewelers, Transforce, and has served on the board of directors of uh, Palladium Portfolio Company, Canela, Del Real, Pronto Insurance, Raven Tire, Teasdale, and Celeritas. Mr. Brujas serves on the board of directors of the New America Alliance. He earned his MS in finance, economics, and cost engineering, and a BS in operations research um, at the George Washington uh, University. So with those introductions, maybe uh, without further ado, I'm going to um, try to go through a number of questions for the participants. And let's start uh, with, with each of the panelists. You know, tell us um, how you approach d and in, in your organization and how ESG plays a role in how their org on your organizations achieved alpha. Maybe we'll start with Joanne. Thank you very much, Milton. As, as some of you know, Fairview Capital was founded and built on the whole basis of diversity and inclusion. And so automatically with respect to ESG, uh, one of the uh, components of ESG was already part of the Fairview Capital story. So the whole issue around Fairview Capital was that the more diverse you are as a firm, uh, it, 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 it also means that supposedly the more successful you should be. And, uh, and, and the broader the opportunity set is, the more opportunity you have for finding um, great companies to invest. And so that has um, been the Fairview motto uh, we have been in business 26 years, and that is what we have done. We have numbers of institutional investors um, that, um, that we have the opportunity and the pleasure of operating on behalf of. And part of why they choose Fairview is because of our track record. So um, I, from our perspective, diversity means success in every, in every way. And we are proud of what we have done and we do not have, with respect to when we're looking at opportunities, we really look at diversity as being one of the critical uh, aspects of being able to be, to be successful in creating a, a large opportunity uh, program of successful, of successful um, of, um, firms across the country. James, you wanna, you wanna give us your perspective? Sure, thanks, Milton. And uh, I think Joanne and your introduction was excellent and, and captured many of the things that we do. Uh, diversity and inclusion is critically important to Blackstone, and we have built it into our investment process. We're very methodical about how we review investments on a set of ESG criteria, which Milton, as you pointed out, uh, is often part of the investment process. Uh, we have purposefully, and I'll talk about some of this later in some of the questions, we purposely designed uh, our recruiting to be much more inclusive and, and to capture a number of applicants and a number of talented individuals that, that perhaps had not been reached as easily in the past. Uh, and then finally, with our portfolio companies uh, and the companies that we back, we're, we're also very purposeful and determined to make sure that we are introducing top leadership and top candidates that, that represent, I think as Joanne very ably put it, 
that diversity of opinions and diversity of views that's critical to get the right perspective and the best perspective around uh, not just investment decisions, but any decisions. So it's a big, it's a big part of our firm. Uh, it has been, and we, we certainly, like many others, have, have doubled down our efforts in the past 24 months. Leon? Thank you, Milton, and thank to, thanks to you, Solange and Gerson, for organizing this uh, Dealmakers Forum, and uh, Joanne and James, I'm honored to be in a, in a panel with you. Uh, look, I'm excited to, to, to be here to talk about the, uh, a topic that is very close to, to my heart. Uh, the diversity and inclusion and ESG are at the core of our DNA at, uh, at Palladium. We like to say that we're one of the largest and oldest minority and women-owned funds in the US. And uh, over 70% of Palladium's employees and 62% of our senior management is either women or diverse. Uh, I, I, I wanna also echo a lot of what, what Joanne and, and James said. And, and, and I guess just to add to the conversation, here's my take on, on, on ESG. If you, if you start with environmental, I think that environmental regulations have been around for a long time. Of course, they have been revised, updated, expanded, but the environment has been part of the boardrooms and investment committees for quite some time. Then you go to governance. I think the standardization of governance practice that was enforced by public in the public company domain has been very good. And this has been also updated, improved, expanded uh, uh, following the well-publicized scandals of the early 2000s. As we know, over the last decade, emphasis on governance has increased and the private markets have begun emulating the public model and in many instances, improving it. For example, at Palladium, uh, our boards include at least two or three independent directors often exceeding the number of Palladium directors in our companies. In addition, we establish various uh, committees such as compensation, audit, et cetera. Um, but really what I think is driving the major shift in, in the so-called ESG ecosystem, it's, it's social. While it, it's always been an important topic, the events that drove troves of people to the streets last year it really highlighted that diversity, equality, and inclusion is an area where transformational change is needed. Of particular relevance to this event and this audience is that uh, it's a statistic that we always talk about it, uh, inside the NEA, which is that the $70 trillion asset management industry, uh, uh, only 1.3% of that 70 trillion is managed by women or minorities, which represent 70% uh, of the population. So there's still a lot of work to do. And obviously at the NAA, we're trying to, to change that. And it wouldn't be an NAA event if I don't say what I say at most NAA events that I get a chance to speak to, which is we believe that, that access to capital is the last frontier of the civil rights movement. Back to you, Milton. Okay, thank you. Um, Joanne, having heard uh, Leon, what do you think, who's actually driving change in our marketplace? Is it the investor demand? Is it the social factors? Um, what's your perspective on that? I actually think it's both. Um, the, the, uh, the moment that we find ourselves in that I guess has become more than a moment um, obviously has had a major impact, but it's also, and I think um, Leon also said this, if you're not successful, in investing across a diverse landscape and you see the returns not there, then there's a question about diversity. So you have to go into the business knowing that diversity is a plus and it only can, and, and the plus means it, it allows us to expand the opportunity set. So I think it is both. I think the moment that we're in is, is helped to uh, dramatize it in many different ways. Uh, it, it is showing us also in many unfortunate ways um, how difficult it is to really maintain and push diversity because of some of the, the, uh, the pushback um, that we're getting um, across the country. It's unfortunate, it's unfortunate, 
But, but having said that, the, uh, the public sector and many of our investors are public pension funds. Uh, they have been actually on the, um, uh, on the front end of this work because they have been much more aggressive about looking at firms and companies to invest in that are diverse because they're representing diverse constituencies. Then I think the foundations who you would have thought would be very proactive have become more proactive uh, in this area. And then we have um, the high net worth families and offices uh, becoming more uh, attentive to the area. So I, I think what has happened is like everybody is paying attention. Um, they're all in. Uh, many uh, of the companies of the type that we're in, uh, the public pension funds, which are big investors, uh, they're looking to make sure that the private equity business uh, is doing what it should be doing in terms of building companies across the, uh, across the country. So I think it's, it's a combination of both. Fantastic. James, just continuing along that line, um, talk a little bit about how you integrate ESG into your investment strategy and portfolio design. That would be very helpful to understand. Um, sure. We, uh, uh, so, so we have done a couple of things. And again, we, you know, we, we have tried to be very purposeful and, and at a Blackstone, we're big believers that, that what is measured improves. And so if you start measuring stuff, strangely enough, the, the uh, results will come that way. Uh, we've set up an impact fund to focus on ESG investments. We have several of our investment themes are directly or indirectly ESG oriented. Uh, and if you look at two recent companies that we took public, very successful public offerings, um, one may be, I hope everyone uses this beverage, but Oatly, which is one of the, one of the leading um, companies in the alternative milk category, which has huge as I'm sure people have read, uh, huge economic impact uh, to the extent we can shift some of the dependence on, on cows and beef. Uh, and then the second is a really interesting company. I'm too old to have used any of the online dating platforms. I had to rely on courage or other things to, uh, to get dates. But, the, um, but we backed a business called Bumble, uh, which is really all about uh, empowering women in the online dating process, a very successful offering led by an extremely dynamic, capable uh, female CEO. Um, and you know, as, as two investments, we think those are very good reflections of the kind of things that, we are, um, that we're looking at. I think, Bill, the, the other question that you had was how has ESG evolved and, and kind of how does it fit into the larger landscape as we think about the future? And this is a little bit of a personal view, but I think a number of people view ESG as addressing the market failure that we have in economics right now, where you've had enormous consequences on the environment. We've not achieved some of the racial uh, justice goals that I think people have had for, for frankly, a number of years. Um, and, and businesses are not still managed the way I think all of us hope in terms of uh, addressing issues like inequality. And so ESG has come about in many ways to address the failure of some of the conventional approaches that we've had. And so, you know, I think I view it and, 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 and others are much more articulate on this, view it as a step in a continuum that will advance over the next few years. And we may look back and say, gosh, it's odd that we called it ESG at the time uh, because it'll be so baked into everything that we do going forward. Fantastic. Leon, how do you address the question of whether ESG impact goals can be reached without sacrificing returns? So there, there, there are mixed views on that, although you know, we have a pretty strong belief that you don't need to sacrifice returns. Just curious how you and your firm think about that. Absolutely, I think it's a, it's a great question. Uh, put simply, at Palladium, we believe that diversity equals alpha which happens to be the title of this uh, forum. And um, we have designed an entire strategy around it. At Palladium, uh, we believe that diversity is a tremendous investment opportunity. Uh, you know, going back a few years, inspired by the 2000 census and the changing demographics of America, Palladium developed a focus on investing in companies that would benefit from the growth of the Hispanic population in the US. Think about this. If US Hispanics were an independent country, 
they will be the seventh largest in the world. And they will be the third largest growing amongst the top 10 largest economies. With that said, the Hispanic market is in the US remains significantly underinvested. And that present an presents an amazing investment opportunity. I would say that after 25 years of doing this and five funds later, I think the effort paid off. Uh, I, I'd also like to add what, what I mentioned earlier is that we at Palladium come from diverse backgrounds and, and, and disciplines. And because of our non-traditional background, we bring a different perspective. And we pride ourselves by finding creative solutions. And I think that these diverse backgrounds make us less prone to, to group thing. And then just to, just to round it up, I, I, I also will be remiss not to mention that, you know, through our investors, we serve over 3 million beneficiaries, which includes teachers, police officers, and civil servants across the U.S. who rely on their pension for their retirements. And I think that many of our investors who are pension funds, I believe that they see in us an opportunity for their private equity managers to look like their constituents. And I, I believe we've delivered on, on that promise. I will also like to add that, that to us, our LPs are not monolithic institutions, but they represent our parents, our grandparents that work very hard their entire lives to provide for their families and serve for their retirements. And I see that, they, they, and I, we at Palladium feel that they have entrusted us with their savings and we see that as a, as a sacred trust. Fantastic. Joanne, um, how do you judge the ROI of, of e ESG? Is it a qualitative or a quantitative assessment at your firm? Talk a little bit about that for us, please. I think it's both, actually. Um, it has to be quantitative, absolutely, but it also has to be uh, qualitative. Because one of, the, one of the things I think is, which is very important, it's not just about diversity. Uh, and it's not just about uh, being able to operate across all, all groups of people, all ethnic groups. It also has a lot to do with integrity. It has a lot to do with, um, with your value system. It has a lot to do with what it is you are trying to accomplish. Uh, with respect to um, your your opportunity set, and so not everybody that can make money is necess is necessarily a fair a fair view opportunity. And I think when you're making a decision about who to invest in, and 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 understand who the people are, you're looking very much at the people themselves, whether or not you feel they have the values, whether or not you feel that they're gonna build something that's gonna, that's gonna be lasting. And also whether or not they operate with integrity. And so the combination uh, is very important because we all know a lot of people who have made a lot of money that you would not wanna be associated with. So that of course is not um, the critical piece, but we do wanna make sure that people are able to build uh, successful companies make sure that the companies that they, they, they are building um, have a certain um, in integrity. And at the same time, we want to be able to make sure that the, the ethics that go into building successful companies in all ways, that that is in place. Because if you don't have that, then as we're looking at diversity, as we're looking at inclusion, as we're looking at everything, uh, it, will, it will take away if you don't have all of those pieces in place. So that's what we try to do. Um, of course, you know, we're a fund to fund. So we're, we're investing uh, across in, within a, a, certain, a certain approach with a certain platform, but we're looking at all of those because, um, you know, the truth of the matter at Fairview, um, I wanna hear, I, wanna, I want all people to be themselves. Take off your uniforms, come as you are, and so that we can see you as, as colleagues and that you will be able to see the people that you're making judgments about for the Fairview portfolio. 
And, uh, and of course, everybody uh, in this business knows how critical that is. And by the way, how much time it saves when you have to go in and, and deal with firms that are different than what you thought they were in the first place. Thank you. Um, James, uh, ESG metrics are not commonly part of the financial reporting of a firm. Is it in your experience at Blackstone that ESG reporting is expected to be included with financial reports or is there a different way that they're going to share those metrics? Yeah, so it's a great question, Milton. We, um, we again, on the theme of being purposeful about all this stuff, uh, we do uh, require in every investment to have an e effectively an ESG audit done, uh, which we review as part of the investment process. As I mentioned before, we look very closely at commitment to diversity, not, not just diversity broadly, but diversity in the senior ranks and, and middle management ranks, the investments that we make. And again, thematically, we're trying to identify investments that fit in with that. The wrap against ESG reporting has been, and I think continues to be, that the metrics um, can be quite complicated. Uh, there are different sources for the metrics, different ways of reporting different things. And I think, and that's all true. I think what people forget is that if you look at financial reporting and you go to different countries, there are different international standards for accounting. And if you look at some things like lease accounting or equipment depreciation rates, a lot of that stuff is also not scientific. There's a lot of judgment and arguably arbitrariness in that. And I think we're gonna have that in some of the ESG reporting for a little while until the, the standards are further developed, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be uh, included. Um, the guys that would love to see them included, uh, Milton, as you know, and the panel knows, are all the accounting firms, which I think see a huge windfall if, uh, if ESG audits can become part of the regular financial statements. So I think we are gonna see much more of this. It's already happening. It's happening within Blackstone in a very developed way, but, but we think it will become much more standard over the next few years. Thank you for that input. Leon, as, as we all know, there are many managers that have been doing ESG investing without calling it ESG by name um, for many years, even before this, this new round of uh, awareness and, and social movement. Um, do you think those managers will have an edge in attracting more AUM and capturing returns? versus others, uh, give us your perspective on that. Thank you, Milton, great question. And, and yes, I, I, I absolutely do. Uh, while diversity may be more on the limelight today, it, it's been a, a hallmark of uh, palladium values uh, and our nearly 25 years of, of generating outstanding returns to our investors. You know, back then we, we didn't call it ESG, we just called it uh, doing the right thing and we believe we have been and, and want to continue to be one of the firms at the, uh, leading the charge in ESG and we've come to consider ESG uh, like, like Joanne and, and, and James a, a core part of what differentiates us from our competitors uh, and like Joanne and, and, and James we also have baked ESG principles into our due diligence process. Uh, all of our deals uh, are, are also viewed through an ESG uh, uh, lens, but also we, 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 we use ESG to, to create stronger value creation plans and, and, and to prepare more compelling uh, exit uh, stories. We see ESG uh, as a value creation tool and we foresee that that it will, over the long term, uh, uh, lead to higher return thresholds and, uh, and distinguish ourselves when, when we go out and, and exit these assets. Thank you. Uh, Joanne, um, you know, ob obviously there's, uh, there's been a lot of focus on environmental for a long time, but today, as you think about the three, the three legs, environmental, social, and governance factors, is there any that, that are in particular driving the increased focus or is it a combination of all of the above? I think it's a combination of governance and social. 
from my perspective. I don't think it's so much environmental. I think that's sort of included in people's portfolio companies and, and various things that they may do. But I think it's governance. And then I think it's social. I think the governance is started with governance, I believe, and the, the social component um, that we're all dealing with and, and, and how we propose to deal with it has now um, kind of converged with the governance. And it's just uh, moved it up, I think, uh, many, many levels as a, as a result of that. Okay. I'm gonna go back to Leon for a moment. Um, I, I, what do you think today are the alpha impact opportunities that investors are seeking to tap across environmental, social, and governance factors, that spectrum, right? So for each one of those, what do you think it is? Sure, and uh, th thank you, Milton. To start, I believe that ESG conscious investments in a portfolio can be both additive to returns as well as providing downside protection. High ESG rated companies tend to have lower exposure to systemic and company specific risk factors. And, and, and I think that that ultimately leads to lower, a lower cost of capital and, and as I said earlier, a, a higher long-term value. Um, and I think that the best way to answer this question is to share two examples of, of our, our portfolio where ESG is clearly driving uh, alpha. And I would like to emphasize what Joanne said pri prior, which is really the, the, the it's really focused on, on, on S, on, on social. So uh, let me share these two examples. Transfers is, a com is one of our companies in our portfolio that focuses on providing technology enabled human capital solutions to the transportation industry. And as many as you might know, there is a major problem in the transportation industry, which is the availability of truck drivers. Given this supply demand imbalance, we decided to invest in a truck driver school to mint our own drivers. The school we invested in had a distinct competitive advantage, which is that 70% of its students are military veterans. The alpha factor was that our customers, which are some of the largest trucking fleets in the US, were extremely excited to hire veterans to their fleets, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because veterans make great drivers. The other example is another one of our portfolio companies, which is called ALC Schools. ALC is a mission-driven company providing student transportation solutions to school districts across the US. They have a proprietary software that is disrupting the, the yellow bus industry. And ALC focuses on transporting special needs kids, which represent approximately 10% of the population, but traditionally have represented about 40% of the cost. The alpha factor here is that through the use of technology, ALC is both able to reduce transportation costs to school districts and enhance experience to this very fragile population. Okay. I'm gonna move now um, to a discussion around uh, the systemic racial inequity. And I wanna start with uh, Joanne. Um, given, given the model, the fund the funds model, you obviously have exposure to lots of, of participants and their portfolio companies, and you've been doing this for a long time. So what uh, ESG policies or actions are large companies or, or medium-sized companies applying internally and externally to address the systemic uh, racial uh, equity uh, uh, that we are, we're trying to, to discuss today? So that... <sighs> Let, I want to. I want to suggest this first. I, you know, if you are involved in this area in general, and it's part of your base philosophy, you therefore are looking for people on the front end that are going to be able to approach the opportunity set in a diverse manner, and 
the example I would use uh, and when I was running the uh, trade association, things like a thousand years ago now, um, the ethnic diversity, and this is, this, is, this, is, this is what is exciting to me about where we find ourselves today, because people are putting time and energy into it. If you don't have any diversity around you in terms of relationships, in terms of, of people that you work with, um, people that you socialize with, whatever it is, if it doesn't exist, it's hard to do it in the first place. And so you've got to be able to be proactive and you've got to really have someone that's a part of a team that is so serious about it that they're going to ensure that it, it takes place. So, so with, res with respect to, um, to Fairview, so you had two founders, uh, African-American, one black, two black, one, one female, one male. Uh, and you are determined to, and you are aligned in your philosophy and you're determined to build a diverse team in the first place. And you know what you're looking for. You're, you're, we, 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 have, we leap over a certain set of, of issues it, immediately. And then you know it's going to be difficult because you've lived it. So you know what it looks like. You know what it feels like. You know what you have to deal with. And so you've got to be able to lean in and, 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 and stay focused and go right at it. So that it, whether it's you know, in terms of females, uh, in terms of racial diversity all across the, the landscape, in terms of working together within those populations, that's critical as well. So if you're able to do that, and that's what we that, that's what Fairview was founded on, and you and you're and able to build a network like that, you're able then to work with all people and eventually, it takes a minute, but eventually people will see that and understand that and actually want to be able to be a part of that or get to know you. And I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about uh, the firm and the individuals within it, uh, generally speaking. And that is what Fairview was able to do, but, but it was founded on that principle in the first place. And that's, who, and that's how we live in America. And if that's how you have to live in America, you have to accustom yourself to be able to build something uh, in that way. And you're able therefore to do a lot of the things that are part of the discussion now. And it also means as Leon has said, and James, you've got to be able to be willing to do some things that may not be comfortable, but in order to make change or create change. Uh, and even if you're not quite there, you've got to be able to be willing to take the leap and to, to see it happen. And when it does happen, and when it does happen in your firm, it will really have some amazing results, even among each other and, and ethnic groups, you know, within. It, is, it has an amazing impact and it makes a huge difference because we have to have a lot of people all in. I don't even know if I answered your question, but, you know. No, I, I think, and, 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 and certainly you see, um, you see a lot from where you sit and you've been doing this for a long time. I think James is one of the largest, Black Snobs is one of the largest uh, investors um, in the world. Um, uh, why, why don't we try to address it in terms of, you know, what, what you see in terms of, of the companies, particularly the larger companies, but also any of the companies that you invest in, because you go up and down the spectrum. Sure. Um, Joanne is a tough act to follow, Milton, so I'm, I'm, I'm not so happy that you keep putting me after her, but in any case, I will, I'll, 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 I'll try. We can to, all learn, we can all learn from Joanne. So we, we, we have been very lucky in our 35 year history to, to reach the point we were at. Um, and I think because of our size, we're at 650 billion in assets under management. We, we feel a real obligation and, and desire to lead by example in this area. Um, I, I mentioned uh, you taking a very purposeful view on this. And let me just give you a couple of examples of that, which you know, I, I think the numbers um, have been terrific in what we've been able to do. One of the things that we believe is that you've got to play a bit of a long game 
uh, in addressing some of these issues. And we've really been very determined to increase the number of uh, people coming into Blackstone that represent diverse backgrounds. Uh, to do that, we've increased the funnel, the recruiting funnel very significantly by going out to not the same schools that everybody goes out to, to recruit from, but really expanding that, um, expanding, expanding that outreach. Um, we've gone from nine schools that we primarily recruited to in 2015 to 44 schools in the past year. We've touched about 450,000 uh, applicants and students uh, coming in who might be interested in working with Blackstone. 44% of our analyst class, which, which as people know is, is the entry level position at a firm like Blackstone or Goldman Sachs or, or any of the other large financial services firms, 44% uh, now is, is diverse. And if you look on the gender diversity point, uh, as Joanne was noting in, in her uh, formation of the, of the firm, um, we were at about 20% of the incoming class is female a few years ago. We're at 45% today. So, so when we've been determined to get stuff done, we, we've been able to make real progress in that front. The other thing that we've done, which I think a lot of companies uh, are also can also do, is to work with students kind of where they live and encourage entrepreneurship and introductions to technology at the schools themselves. Uh, we launched a program called Blackstone Launchpad which we've significantly expanded now to 75 colleges uh, and, and, and are working with kids on entrepreneurship programs in the school, in the classroom, if you will, to introduce them to the investment process and some of the career paths that they might have. And then the final thing that I'll, I'll mention briefly is we've also focused, um, Milton, your point on what we can do with other companies. Um, you know, we, we do own a number of companies outright around the world. Uh, and have been focused on both recruiting board members that reflect diversity and then ensuring that the leadership of those businesses reflects diversity. And about 50% of the leadership of our portfolio companies now is diverse. So I think we, we uh, think setting our mind to this, uh, it's not going to be an overnight change, but I think we're going to be able to show real progress uh, as we have uh, and, and will continue to over the next few years. That's pretty impressive. You know, we uh, mm -hmm. we were fortunate that, you know, we started our firm, for example, in 2014. And we started with that as one of our, uh, you know, with diversity as one of our missions, in particular, given my own background. Um, and so we, you know, we've been able to do that continuously and consistently, thereby having more than 50% of the firm today be uh, diverse and, and more than 30% of our boards, but we're, we're, you know, it's, it's continuous and it starts at the top from the top down. And that's where it's got to be, be driven. Um, so Joanne, I'm going to go back to a question then related to, um, investment decisions that, that your firm makes. How do you, how do you take that into consideration, uh, diversity and inclusion and how does that, uh, affect or mitigate, uh, investment risk from your from your perspective, or does it? Well, it it does, and I think one of the reasons it does. Well, we have a very diverse investment um, team, and with all types of backgrounds, and of course that's very important. And then the other thing is, depending on their background, some of it's um, in the healthcare. You know, we have a former uh, doctor. You know, so you've got all types of. Of, um, of backgrounds at, at Fairview on the investment team. So as they're reaching out to funds and looking at funds, some that are that are um, newer, we're, we're, we're big in the venture business. So we're all across the venture landscape. So when we're reaching out to newer funds or funds where we, we know or we've heard of, uh, obviously that diversity helps because um, there's, there's a, there's a uh, built-in re potential relationship that that can happen immediately, and we and we and we can spend time. the The other thing is, um, because of how we started our business, there was always a sense of trust. And so, when when you have firms starting up or their first, second, wherever they are, and they want to be able to come to a potential investor and be able to have conversations, and they want to be, be able to trust that the information provided is going to stay within within that firm. Uh, you build a great sense of trust among potential funders because, I mean, funds, because of course we say no a lot, 
but that doesn't mean it's no forever. And that also does not mean that we uh, are not cheering for your success. So, so we have, we have been a trusted um, um, investor, I, I think from day one, and that's the reputation um, I think we have. I think Leon would, would, would say that uh, about Fairview. The, the other thing I think has been very important is that um, we, we, we will go most places um, and, and we, we will spend time getting to know the firms and that's very important. And then, and, then, and then I guess it's just as important to make sure that our investors are comfortable or confident that we can do what we say we can do because they are hiring you for certain reasons. And so they wanna be able to look at your track record. They wanna look at your impact. They wanna be able to see who you're investing in. And they wanna be able to see that you can do that for them as well, depending on what strategy that they want to um, um, uh, use to um, for their portfolio. So that's a piece of it too. So I, I, think, I think you have to be, uh, Milton, an honest broker, so to speak. Uh, you have to be able to do what you say you you can do. And then I think you have to be able to realize, you know, kind of, I mean, every day is not a good day. So you've got to be able to, uh, you know, um, make the adjustments and, and make the changes as, as things occur. Because, you know, we have, there's a very competitive marketplace. We have a lot of competitors. We try to conduct ourselves in, in, a, in sort of an upstanding way, you know, looking forward. And, um, and, and, and to be sure people know where we stand and, and who we are. So I think it's all of those things uh, together and we've got to be able to do great work because we have to provide the returns. And so that never can go second to anything. Uh, but we do think there's a lot of things that are first all along the continuum uh, that go into the Fairview philosophy. But we share your point of view. We're, we're all human, um, no matter how, hard we try, we, we're gonna make mistakes. Even the legend Warren Buffett makes mistakes, I always tell people. Um, but transparency and continuous learning and, and willingness to change is critical. I'm gonna um, ask this last question so that we, we stay on time to all three of the panelists. And, and, and I'm gonna grant James his wish. I'm gonna start with him. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I think, I think uh, for, for our audience, which, which I wanna thank in advance for having tuned in today. Um, do you have uh, a single thing, large or small, that, that you would say to them they can do to mitigate this, this whole systemic racial um, uh, equality issue? Um, and, and I'll start with James and then, and then Leon and, and Joanne will go with you last. Um. Yeah, Milton, I'll be, look, I, I'm, I'm old enough to be humble about giving advice and, and, and perspective, uh, but I do, I do think, you know, that the old saying that the longest journey begins with a single step is true. And I think Joanne framed it really well, which is these small steps can make a huge difference. And so in our case, it was doing things like simply expanding where you go to recruit. Um, setting a goal that a class size is going to reflect X percent in diverse professionals. Doing those small things really does start to add up because you create the role models and networks and, and professional experiences that, that ultimately are what's going to turn things for the better over the long term. So, so I, again, I want to be humble about giving, but it would be just to set a small goal of what's achievable in the next 12 to 24 months and then just get it done. And then you've got the next goal. And before you know it, you'll be running a marathon, which was many years behind me, but, but that's how it all starts. <laughs> okay. Leon, you um, give us your, your thoughts. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. I, I would like to also uh, use a, a, another popular quote, which is that you, you should be the change that you want to see in the world. Um, and you heard me say earlier that 72% that of palladium is, is diverse or, or female. And, you know, also, and this is not something that is exclusive to us, but 80% of our boards have minority or female board representation. And we have a goal to have at least two minority and two female board members 
in every one of, of our boards. And, and I guess, you know, what, what, what we believe at Palladium is, is we have come to embrace what we call stakeholder capitalism, which is an approach that appreciates not just the interest of shareholders, but also the one of suppliers, employees, consumers, and the communities in which we, we operate. And, and, and I think that, you know, going back to the, the systemic uh, uh, racial inequality, think that, that diversity uh, targets and, and disclosures much, they have to extend beyond hiring and re retaining and promoting. It, it, you know, I think that there has to be a lot more transparency, which is an initiative that we're working at the at the at the NAA around uh, around the pay gap and 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 the efforts to improve representation at the upper echelons of or organizations. Ultimately, I believe that that success breeds success, and for example, people naturally tend to want to find areas of common ground when they're beginning a relationship. So when thinking, uh, so it's no surprise that clusters generate around people with similar traits. So when thinking about diversity and inclusion, more participation of minorities and women will have a multiplier or viral effect. And in that it will open networks and it will turn, in turn give other minorities and women opportunities in, 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 in introductions and so on and so forth. So, so I think that the, the, it's ultimately, yes, it starts with a small step, but it will have an exponential effect if we continue to do our job. And thank you for having, uh, for having me. Thank you. Joanne, uh, if you give us your, your thoughts, please. I think um, James said something um, very important. In order for things to really change, you have to have everybody all in. And so um, if we were in this moment and, and you had some, a firm like Blackstone saying that, you know, we're satisfied with, you know, the way we are, we're doing things fine, we're successful, we don't have to do anything differently. And, and that would be a catastrophe actually, because we need the private equity field along all lines to, to change and to, and to see how that change can make you a better firm. And so if Blackstone um, is doing it, then others, um, other buyout funds of that size will do it. Uh, the mid-sized buyout firms will do it. The venture firms will do it. Everybody in the private equity business will begin to uh, transform and, and they will be better off for it because they will be able to be more competitive. And I think, uh, and I think this session and organizations like NAA are very critical because they are on the front line, basically uh, speaking the truth and, and allowing all people to understand how that change um, is so important to society. So I think that is, when we talk about this, that's what's so exciting. I think the second um, aspect of this is, is it's great to be a launch pad. You know, it's great to talk about being first, you know, blah, 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 blah. But if you're the first and only, uh, then there's a question as to whether you've been successful. And so um, I think that's why it's so important to have an NAA, to have NEIC, to have all the organizations that push this work forward and, 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 and enable uh, you to even have this discussion and to be ha and have everybody from all aspects of, of the business um, involved, and then um, and then the the last thing I will say is that um, I, you know our business and I'm talking about the uh, the um, private equity business in general is the best of all entrepreneurial businesses because you have the best of all people in it of all backgrounds all experiences, all types of training. And so it allows you to have an insatiable curiosity and to be able to keep moving forth, forward and doing great things as a result of it. You, it, it your, your curiosity is more powerful than your fear of failure. And, and I, so I think as our firms um, mature and really be able to broaden the landscape and the opportunity set
for everybody who is prepared to step on stage and do the work, uh, the private equity business will be just one very tremendous business and will be able to be, I think, the industry that will be uh, set to make the significant change going into the future. So if I had one, um, one suggestion or thought for the, um, for the audience, I would say judge us all, not only by what we say, but by what we do. That will keep uh, everybody focused, not only today, but in the future if you, if you do that. So that would be my one uh, suggestion. I want to thank um, uh, Solange and Gershon and NAA for giving me the opportunity to um, host such an important topic today on diversity and inclusion and, and ESG, but equally as important to give me the opportunity to, to have such an amazing uh, uh, panel of specialists. Uh, and so thank you, Joanne. Thank you, James. And thank you, Leon, for your participation today. And I'm, I wish everybody a, uh, a terrific rest of the day. Thank you very thank you, much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you all, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us today. Um, I love these discussions because I always take away important information. And uh, from James and Leon today, I learned not to follow Joanne. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but seriously, the discussion embodied how the proactive approach is needed in this area. The speakers today are an example of the most proactive folks here. So this is, it's, it's good information to, to, uh, to digest. Um, a long time ago, someone told me that everything would be fine when the population of the country is more diverse. So they said, so long you don't have to worry about that. And what I said was women have been we have been the majority in this country for many, many years, yet we still have a ways to go to be represented in the financial services industry. What I heard today, but these four very incredible speakers gives me a lot of hope. So with that, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And Gerson, I uh, hand it over to you. All right, well, I'll be very brief here, everyone. Uh, in the chat function, I sent out the link for our next session uh, with the Honorable uh, Robert Menendez, Senator from the great state of New Jersey. Um, as I've been telling people, the E and the S begins with a strong G, and he will be talking about uh, legislation he has introduced to improve corporate governance uh, through diversity in, in the US. So uh, look forward to seeing everyone here. I also recommend if you haven't already seen it, uh, there is an article today in the Wall Street Journal highlighting that the S&P 500 has tripled the share of diverse directors uh, in the past year. Uh, that being said, we still have a long way to go uh, with only 30% of such directors as women, 11% are Black, 4% Latinos, and 6% Asians. So plenty of progress, but it's a long road ahead. So please join us uh, when we speak to the Senator. Uh, I can't promise it'll be as exciting as the session with Senator Tim Kaine, where he was voting on legislation while speaking to us, uh, but it will definitely be informative. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>